Well, good morning, church. I want to just thank you for this weekend. Uh, it has been a great, sweet weekend with our family and with you guys. We have really enjoyed getting to know people. Uh, for those of you we haven't got to spend a lot of time with yet, uh, my name is Chris Farrell, my wife Amanda, our children Easton and Haley. We, we just want to thank you. It's, it's been sweet. And uh, we, we really look forward to what God has for us this morning um, as we open his word. In 2004, Tim McGraw wrote one of his most famous songs called Live Like You Are Dying. Some of you may be familiar with the song if you're a country music fan. I want to read some of the things about this song. The, the story behind the song is that it's a conversation between two guys. And one of the gentlemen has recently discovered that he has terminal cancer. And he doesn't have much time left to live. And so the other gentleman that he's talking to ask him, what's it like? Well, how did you handle that kind of news? What, what do you do with your life now that you know that you know what the end's coming? These are some of the things that he said. He said, I went skydiving. I went Rocky Mountain climbing. I went 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu. He said, I loved deeper. I spoke sweeter. I gave forgiveness that I'd been denying. I finally became the husband most of the time I wasn't. I became a friend that a friend would like to have. I went fishing three times the year I lost my dad. I read the good book. I took a good hard look at what I'd do if I could do it again. And I'd live like tomorrow was a gift. Now there's some things in there that are kind of funny. Who wouldn't want to ride a bull named Fu Manchu, right? Right? But there's some pretty deep stuff in there. There's some pretty important stuff. Be the husband most of the time I wasn't. Be the friend a friend would like to have. Maybe read the good book. Maybe that, that would be important. Um, there's some really good stuff there for us. We're going to talk today about 1 Peter's letter. 1 Peter. Now, if you're not familiar with 1 Peter at all, all you need to do is flip to the back of your Bible and then go left just a little bit, just a hair, just a hair. Don't go too far. You might pass him. But we're going to be in 1 Peter today. 1 Peter was written by Peter uh, in the early 60s. So think about this. About roughly 30 years after Jesus has left the earth, he wrote this letter. And it was... In Rome, that he wrote this letter during the time of Nero. I don't know how much you know about Nero, but he was not a great guy. But when he wrote this letter, it wasn't quite as bad as it was going to get. Nero was about to make it a lot worse. But at the time he wrote this letter in the early 60s, it was a few years before Peter would die. And it was a few years before it got really bad in Rome for the Christians. But he wrote this letter to a bunch of churches. It was a circuit letter. It wasn't just to one church, but it went to a bunch of churches uh, throughout the Roman Empire down south of the Black Sea in what today you might know of as Asia Minor. And if you look on a map, most of these churches are in present-day Turkey. So just to give you a frame of reference, if you ever look at a map, Turkey is where this conversation is happening. And he's writing this letter to the Christian churches in this area because they were facing persecution. Now, not the type of persecution that you think of where they were being slaughtered and all this, but it's kind of the persecution that maybe many Christians, even here in America, would experience. People talking bad about you, making fun of you, making it hard for you to live life. Now, it's going to get a lot worse for these Christians further on, but at this point in the early 60s, it's not terrible, but it's it's getting there. And so Peter is writing this letter to them to let them know that in these last days, there's hope to be found in Jesus. And that we're to live differently 
even in the midst of suffering. Wayne Grudem, who's a professor at Phoenix Seminary, when he talked about 1 Peter, he said that the central verse in the whole letter is going to be in the fourth chapter, verse 19, where it says, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. It's really an interesting thing. Therefore let those who suffer. How many of you can say in your lives that you've suffered? Anybody be able to say that? Whether it's physical suffering, emotional suffering, spiritual, mental, whatever it is. Can I get an amen that somebody suffered here? Okay. This, this letter is for you, okay? Um, he said, for those who are suffering according to God's will. Did you know that God has a will and a purpose for you, even in the midst of your suffering? Even in the midst of it, God has a will and a purpose. He wants you to entrust your souls to the faithful creator. God's your creator, and he's faithful while doing good. While doing good. So l- let, me, let me just summarize this, kind of summarize Peter's verse right here. Each and every one of us have a faithful creator. All of us have one. You may believe in him, you may not, but the fact is you have a faithful creator. And the truth is, is that you will suffer. But in the midst of that suffering, whatever it is, he wants you to entrust your soul to him And do good. In the midst of your suffering, he doesn't want you to sit there and go, woe is me. He doesn't want you to tap out and say, it's not worth it. What he wants you to do is to press into him, your faithful creator, and do good. Keep going. Don't give up. Do good. And so that's what Peter's talking to these Christians is, is when somebody at work makes fun of you because of your difference. Do good to them. Stay faithful to them. Now, I personally think that any time you read something, it's important to know who it is that you are reading it from and whether you can trust them, right? Like, if somebody just randomly wrote to you a letter or called you and said, hey, I want you to do this, this, and this, and you had no idea who they were, you'd be a little skeptical. But if you knew they were a friend and you could trust them, then you'd probably pay a little more attention. So what I want to do for the next few minutes before we jump into what Peter says to the churches, I want us to talk about Peter, who he is, and why it's important that we can trust him. You see, Peter also is known as Simon. If you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll often hear him called Simon. It was later that Jesus changed his name to Peter. You also might see him called Cephas throughout the Gospels as well. But Peter, he is dynamic. He is outspoken. He is strong-willed. He is impulsive. He's brash. Do we have any Peters in the room? Anybody? Yeah, we got a few Peters. All right. We say get, thank God for Peters. Peters. Peter's all in. He's not one of those halfway guys. He may be going the wrong direction, but he's going the wrong direction at 100 miles an hour. All right? Peter was a fisherman. Peter worked with James and John, and he was in the fishing industry, which in that time was pretty good living. Pretty good living. He met Jesus through his brother Andrew. How cool is that? For those of you who have siblings, think about that. How cool is that that if your sibling met Jesus, the first person they would come to is you? You got to meet this guy. And that's what Andrew did. He said, I got to go tell my brother. And then Peter became a disciple of Jesus. Now, there's several words in the Bible that sometimes you may or may not know because they're not common. We don't use the word disciple a whole lot, do we, anymore? But disciple is simply the idea of a pupil. A pupil. Now, it's different than what we experience today. Like, you may see a student as a pupil, and they come to school, and they learn during the day uh, math and science and English and all that. 
But back in this day, when you were a disciple of a teacher, whether it's Jesus or there was tons of teachers that had disciples, you were all in. It wasn't you just go for a little bit and you learn one particular thing. Like, you're learning everything from this person. You're spending time with them day in, day out. You're having meals with them. You're staying with them. You are learning not just the basics of what would be the Old Testament law, but you're learning how to be a husband. You're learning how to be a father. You are learning the important stuff of life from whoever your teacher is if you are a disciple. So Peter was that. Jesus had lots of disciples. If you read the Gospels, he had huge followings. People loved him. They followed him. But then Peter was also part of a smaller group called the Apostles. And he was kind of the de facto leader of the Apostles. Now, some Christian traditions still use the word apostle. It's a lowercase a. But basically, an apostle is someone who's sent out. Someone who's sent out. A lot of times you will see uh, somebody saying they have the gift of apostleship because they start churches. They're a church planter. And so they go and they start lots of churches. So there's apostles. But what this is, is this was a very select group that were with Jesus while he lived. And they went to start the missionary mission of Jesus and start churches all over the known world. So Peter was one of the disciples, and he was one of the apostles, but then he was also one of the three close inner circle to Jesus. So him and James and John were part of that inner circle. So there's a lot to be learned about Jesus' ministry that we're not going to talk about today, but about here, here, and here. It's a big principle for churches Today, as we've got large settings, we need some smaller, and then we need some intimate discipleship as well. But that's what Peter was involved in. Peter was the guy that in the Gospels walked on water with Jesus. You remember this story? Peter got to walk on the water, and then what did he do? He almost drowned. <laughs> that's Peter. Like, Peter, like, hey, I'll walk out on the water, and then, uh oh, I'm in trouble. That's Peter. Peter also had the nerve to rebuke Jesus to his face because Jesus was talking to the disciples about his death. That didn't go real well for Peter, but he did it. That's that brashness. Can you imagine talking to Jesus like that? You'd have to have a pretty good relationship to pull that off, wouldn't you? <laughs> Peter's also the guy that in the garden cut off the high priest servant's ear. Like, you ain't taking Jesus. And probably the biggest of Peter's oops is he denied Jesus three times. When the going got tough and people came and Jesus was on trial and people came and said, hey, you were one of his followers. Peter like, no, not me, not me. So Peter's got some highs and lows, right? But, isn't it cool that we have a God that's a but God? But God. But God. Some of you in here, that's what you hold on to. Your life, you've had some mistakes. You've done some things that you like, I know God doesn't like it. Some of you feel like God can't forgive you for those things. And you still carry them with you. And there's some of you in here that are like, thankfully, I have a but God. But God changed everything for me. God changed my life. He changed my marriage. He changed my relationship with my kids. He changed my work situation. But God. But, but God allowed Peter to be the foundation and part of the start of the church. And you read in Acts, Pentecost, the day that the church started, the Holy Spirit came, thousands were saved. Who was the main preacher in that? Peter. But God. The guy who couldn't walk on water because he had so much faith he was going to drown. Spoke on Pentecost, thousands saved. Peter is the guy 
that God gave a vision to of a sheet coming out of the sky with all these animals that were unclean that the Jews couldn't eat or touch. And God said, I've made them clean. And he said, go and preach to not just the Jews anymore, but go preach to the Gentiles, the Samaritans, the dirty and untouchables. And Peter went to a Roman named Cornelius to share the gospel. And I don't think you can appreciate that, really, because the Jews hated the Romans. The Romans were the pagans. They were the evil people. They were the oppressors that made everything for a Jew miserable. And God says, go share the gospel to them. There's some of you probably sitting here today that there's people in your life that you're thinking, I don't want anything to do with them. I don't like what they do. I don't like what they think. I don't like how they vote. I don't like whatever it is. And God's saying to you today, my message, my gospel is as much for them as it is for you. Think about that. That's how revolutionary it is. Think of the person that you do not want to associate with. That's what Peter was faced with and God said, go. That's what he's saying to us today. Think of the people you don't want to associate with. Go. Share the gospel. Peter also worked with Mark. Mark wrote the gospel, Mark. And it's the story of Peter for a large part of it. Peter was the one that told Mark about the story of Jesus. Mark wasn't around. It was Peter. That's pretty cool. When you read the book of Mark, you're reading Peter's story. And lastly, Peter was killed in the late 60s in Rome by Nero. And they hung him on a cross. That's how he died. But Peter told the Romans, he said, I'm not worthy to die like my Lord. And so they hung him upside down. Peter gets it. When we read the books of First Peter, we can trust it because Peter was all in. He lived the mistakes. He lived being next to Jesus. He was willing to go to literally the cross for the gospel. So thankfully, we can trust him. Does that make sense? We know that we can trust him. So we're going to spend time in chapter 4 today. 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to focus on verses 7 through 11. So if you want to start going there. The first six verses, just to give you a real quick summary, is... Peter talking about how Jesus suffered for living differently. And that us as Christians should, should expect that as well. If you suffer, that's not unique. I would challenge you to say if you don't suffer, that's unique. If you look at your life and you're like, my life is easy, I got no problems, that's the challenge. The Christian life is meant to be one of suffering. But because of Jesus, we're good. We don't have to worry about it. Jesus saved us, and we're going to be strange to people. The people that you used to run with, there's probably a lot of you in here that have been walking with Jesus for a long time. And it's probably even hard to remember the day that you didn't walk with Jesus. But there's some of you in here that you can probably still remember the day Jesus changed your life and how the people that you used to run with thought you were strange. They were like, what happened to you? You're not going out with us and doing what we used to do. You're not talking the way you used to talk. You're not thinking the way you used to thought, think. And that's what Peter's talking about is Jesus was the same way. He suffered. He was ridiculed because he was different. That's the same thing for us. But it's okay. Some of you may remember in 1995, a group named DC Talk 
You remember that group? Old school. They had a song called Jesus Freak. Can everybody remember that? All right. What will people think when they hear that I'm a Jesus freak? What will people do when they find out it's true? I don't really care if they label me a Jesus freak because there is no hiding the truth. You know, there's some, that's some powerful words right there. Are you okay with being a Jesus freak? So that is where the lead up is to what we're going to talk to. So in 1 Peter 4, chapter seven, or verse 7 through 11, let's read it together. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's very grace, whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. It's really interesting. As soon as Peter finishes the first six verses talking about how you need to live differently. And because of that, you're going to suffer. People are going to talk about you and, and make fun of you for living that. He says, the end is at hand. But what did he mean by that? Surely it's not that Peter thought that today Jesus was coming back. You've got to remember, Peter's writing this 30 years after Jesus has left the scene. What Peter's talking about is that in the plan of God to redeem his people... Everything that was needed has occurred. Jesus has come to the earth. He's lived his life. He's lived his ministry. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and the Holy Spirit has come. Everything that is needed has happened. So that's why Peter can tell his, his churches the end is at hand. It's not that he knows that tomorrow Jesus is coming back, or if he's coming back in a hundred years, he knows that everything needed for Jesus to come back has now happened. If you're a believer here today, you should realize that you're a sojourner, you're an exile. This is not your home. I think sometimes we get confused and we think earth is our home. Earth is not our home. We are here for a short time. And because of that, we should live in view that it is a short time. And your life should count now. Every day. You don't get to have put it off till tomorrow. You don't get to have, well, Jesus isn't coming back for another hundred years. We don't know. And that's what Peter wants you to understand. The end is at hand. Live as if you are dying, as if today is your last day. Martin Luther, the great German theologian of the 1500s, was asked, if you knew tomorrow was the end, if Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would you do? And he said, well, I'd get up, I'd go plant a tree, and I'd pay my taxes. What do you mean by that? He meant that he didn't have to change how he lived every day because every day he lived as if Jesus was coming back. So that should be our hope is that every day when you wake up, you are living as if today's the last day. I need to make every day count. For those of you who are list takers, I got something for you. We got some list takers in here. Anybody like to take lists? Okay, good, good. All right. Four things we should be doing if we want to live as if it's our last day. All right, you ready? I know you got a place to write on there. Four things. Here we go. Number one, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded. All right, Peter, that's the next verse. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded. Have you all ever noticed that the thought of the nearness of the end of time makes people absolutely crazy. 
Have you noticed that? People go crazy. They do crazy things. How many of you remember in 1999 what the big scare was amongst Christians? Y2K, the world's ending, the computers are going to crash, everything we know is going away. What happened? Not much of anything. Not much of anything. You can literally, I don't care, we could turn on social media or the news right now and you're going to hear craziness about everything because people are worried about stuff. Don't worry about it. Be sober minded. Be self-controlled. Why do people think Christians are weird? Why? It's because of this stuff. And there's no reason. Maybe you have in the past, or maybe even today, you worry about the end. You worry about end time stuff. I'm hoping that by the time we finish here with 1 Peter, maybe you're not. Maybe you just relax and be normal. (laughs) <laughs> be sober-minded, self-controlled. Don't freak out about the things you can't control. Worry about the things you can control. And the reason he says be self-controlled and sober-minded is for the sake of your prayers. You ever thought about that? This is a big theme with Peter, for the sake of your prayers. Earlier in 1 Peter, he talks about if your marriage isn't good, if you and your spouse are struggling and fighting and bickering, it hinders your prayers. Anybody ever, you don't have to raise your hands this time, but anybody ever experienced that? Yeah? You and your spouse are not getting along and you feel like, man, God, I'm just hitting a wall. I'm hitting a wall in my prayers. Our actions affect our prayer life. You ever thought about that? That's crazy, isn't it? So think, if you're going to live sober-minded and self-controlled, that also means acting sober-minded and self-controlled because you don't want it to affect your prayers, your communication with God. So that's number one. Number two, above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. So that's number two. I'm sure Peter was thinking of when he wrote this, Proverbs 10, 12. It says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers a multitude of offenses. On June 17th, 2015, in Charleston, South Carolina, at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, there was a Bible study being held that day. And a boy named Dylan Rolfe walked in that morning to that Bible study. And he shot and killed nine people. All because of the color of their skin. It was horrific. It made national news. You probably all remember that. All because somebody hated somebody because of the color of their skin. I remember watching the news and people just couldn't understand it. Absolutely could not understand it. A few weeks later, Dylan Rolfe is sitting in court. And one by one, the families of the victims stood up in the courtroom in front of Dylan Rolfe. And they told him how much pain he had caused them. The loss that he had taken from them. And then they forgave him. They forgave him. That evil was covered by a multitude of sins. Let me tell you, folks, that kind of forgiveness, that kind of love, that's not natural. That is supernatural. And it only happens... If you've experienced the grace and forgiveness and love that our God offers, that does not come naturally. There are all sorts of things that happen in a church family, from small to big. And you have an opportunity probably almost every day 
to either take an offense that somebody says or does against you and run with it and be resentful, be angry, not want to talk to them anymore, start a rumor about them, or you have the option to love them, think the best of them, and to forgive them. I promise you that if I come and you call me to be your senior pastor, there will be things that I will say. I may have already said something this morning you didn't like. There will be things that I will probably do that you don't like. And you'll have options of the way to handle it. You can, after I'm done, go corner me out here and talk to me about how you disagree with what I said. You can call me. You can text me. You can email me. What I would challenge you to do is what I call three days of grace. I would challenge you once I do something or say something, and you can apply this to anybody, instead of cornering me, emailing me, texting me, whatever, I want you to go home, and for the next three days, I want you to pray. I want you to search the scriptures. I want you to speak to other godly people, and I want you to say, am I off here, or is maybe I need to rethink this? And, and if it is that we still need to have a conversation, I am perfectly happy with doing that. But here's what's going to happen over those three days. Your heart's going to soften, and we're going to have a different conversation because of it. It's not going to be adversarial because what are you thinking? What did you do? Why did you do that? It's going to be like, let's have a conversation because we love each other and we care about this church. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So that's, that's just an ask. Um, that I would encourage you to apply across the board. But um, I, I know it's very easy in the heat of the moment to let our emotions get the best of us. But if we're willing to love earnestly, love will cover a multitude of sins. Fair? Okay. Three. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Hospitality was extremely important in the early church. The church was not rich. <laughs> there was no mega churches with million dollar budgets. When people traveled across the Roman Empire or across the countries to share the gospel or to plant churches, they depended on fellow Christians to provide them housing food, maybe some money for their travels. It was hugely important for them. And that is just as important today for Christians to show hospitality. Now, I want to brag this morning a little bit on my wife. This is, she has many, many gifts, but hospitality is right up there at the top, I think, with her. And, any of y'all remember earlier in the year, the big storm that blew through Texas and just like wiped out the whole state. Uh, we live in, in Dallas and we got hit hard. Millions of homes without power, um, freezing temperatures. We thankfully uh, live right next to a hospital. So we were on a hospital grid, so we didn't lose power. So we had a couple different options. We could thank God that we didn't lose power and we still had heat and uh, uh, stoves and microwaves and all that type of stuff. And we could have prayed for those who didn't. Um, that was option A. But for Amanda, option A wasn't what we needed to do. Her option was we need to thank God that we have it. We need to pray for those who don't. But we need to invite into our home people who don't. So we started calling people that didn't have electricity, and we had people come stay with us. Provide them a warm place to sleep. Amanda provided them with meals. We had an option. She could have complained about it. I mean, bringing somebody into your house for several days, providing food, shelter, all that. You could complain about that. She didn't. It wasn't even a consideration. She was like, we've been gifted this home. Let's use it. 
For most of our married life as well, we've had Bible studies in our home. We've invited families over to our house uh, once a week. And it's adults and lots of kids. <laughs> and maybe some of you can relate. Uh, a house with 10 to 12 little kids running around. You've probably already seen my two already, and you're like, oh, my gosh. Um, imagine that times 10. Um, it would be very easy to complain about the, the time it takes to prepare the house, prepare food, and then clean up after all the little kids pulled every toy that they can find in our house out. Um, but she doesn't. She doesn't because she views our house as a place of ministry, not something to hold on to. How many times have you invited somebody to your home? Whether it's for a meal, whether it's they need some place to stay, how many times have you reached out to a neighbor, a coworker, somebody who is different than you, and invited them into your home and showed them hospitality? I want to challenge you to think about that. If it's something you're great at, awesome. If it's something you struggle with, then it's something to pray about and work on because it is foundational to who we are as Christians to show hospitality to people. Fourth, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Every one of us in this room, myself included, every one of us, was created by a faithful creator who loves us. Every one of us in this room is what the Bible calls sinners. We are separated from God, both because of our nature, our bent nature-wise to want to rebel against God and to make ourselves our own God, but then also out of acts that we commit. Whether it's deeds we do, whether it's thoughts we have, we are in rebellion against God. And it separated us from him. But God, once again, but God. Thank goodness for that, but God. But God loved us and wanted to reconcile us to himself. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to live the life that you and I couldn't live. Let's make no mistake about this. We could not live the life that Jesus lived. We are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but Jesus was. He was like us in every way but sin. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He got tired. He got frustrated with people. He was like us in every way, but he never sinned. So he had to live the life that we could not live, to be the sacrifice that we could not be. And he went to the cross for us. And he died on that cross because only he could. You and I couldn't. When Peter died on that cross, he didn't save anybody. Jesus had to do it. He had to be the perfect sacrifice and when he did that he went to the cross then he went to the tomb and then three days later he rose again conquering sin and death and what he did in doing that was he made it possible for us to be reconciled to the God the Father and what he asked us to do is to repent of our sins and to place our faith in Jesus alone He's the only one that can save us. And so if you're here this morning and you're struggling with church, if you're struggling with the message of God and Jesus, I want to tell you this morning that God loves you and he wants you to be reconciled to him through Jesus. And the cool thing about it is when Jesus saves you, your life becomes different. And one of the great gifts, there's a lot of them, but one of the great gifts that we receive 
is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into your life and he changes everything. And there's a multitude of things he does. But here talks about the Holy Spirit gives us gifts. Every one of you in here that has placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you've received a gift from the Holy Spirit. And there's a multitude of them. You can read in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, throughout the New Testament, there's talks about the gifts. But those gifts are given to us as a body of believers, not for ourselves, but to use to bless each other. I want you to understand that every one of you has that gift. And it's a gift to be used, not just for a period of time, but for your whole life. We talked about it last night. We've talked about it a lot with the search committee, with the deacons. No matter where you are in life, it's not time to tap out. It's time to press in and use the gifts that God has given us. Because those gifts are what will build the church, build your relationships with other people. One of the biggest misconceptions of the church in America, and it's really unique because it really is a Western thing, primarily in America, is the concept of, well, we hire a minister to do the ministry. But the Bible knows nothing of that thought. That's not a biblical thought. The biblical thought is that everyone has a gift and you are a minister. You are to use your gifts to minister to the body. So whether you've been a follower of Jesus for 70 years or 70 seconds, you're called to serve and use your gifts. And if you need help figuring out what those are, we want to do it. We want to help you figure out how to use those gifts and, and to use that. If you don't know who Jesus is and you're wondering still about all this, I want to talk to you. I'll be right here afterward. Come talk to me. Let's talk. If you need prayer because you're struggling, I'll be right here. Come see me. When we speak, whether it's me, whether it's you, whether we serve, everything that we do is not for ourselves, but it's for the glory of God through Jesus Christ who changed us. That's why we do it. I want you guys to look around. Do you see every seat in here full? Can you see it? Can you see this place full? Can you hear the roar of children learning about Jesus in the children's ministry? Can you hear it? I can. I can see all these seats filled with people. I can hear, I can hear my kid. Uh, I, can, <laughs> I, I can hear the roar of our children's ministry with kids being taught about Jesus. This isn't going to happen in our own strength. This will not happen because we have a beautiful building. It won't happen because we have tremendous people leading music and leading worship for us. It definitely isn't going to happen because you have the best preacher in town. That's not going to happen. What's going to happen is... People in this community will come to know Jesus if we're doing these things, if we're talking, if we're living, if we're praying, if we're serving, if we're being hospitable, all for the name of Jesus, not for ourselves. The goal is not to make the name of First Baptist Crane big. The goal is to make the name of Jesus huge. And if we do that, this town will look different. People will know Jesus, they will love Jesus, and you will get to reap the rewards of being the person that told them about it, that showed them about it, who prayed with them, who cried with them, who hugged them. You get to reap the benefits of it, not because you're cool, but because you are obedient to the one who saved you and made it possible for you to do that. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you have assembled these people here to hear your word. And Jesus, we thank you. We cannot thank you enough for your grace and for coming to this earth, living the life we could not live, 
dying the death we deserve but could not do, and for raising from the dead to conquer sin and death. And Holy Spirit, we are so grateful to you for coming into our lives, for giving us gifts, for making us more like Jesus. I pray for these people. I pray that today they would take the words that you gave Peter and that they would figure out how to apply them to their lives in their neighborhoods, in their work, at school. And I pray that you would turn this city upside down for the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.